Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Dale. I'm going to be briefly talking today about the world of, of software and sports. Uh, this was meant to be somewhat timely, uh, timed around the Olympics. We're a few days late, but I, I think we're still in the window of relevancy here. These cameras, developed by Panasonic, were tracking archers at this year's Olympic Games in Tokyo. The athletes weren't wearing any heart monitors. There was no other hardware attached to the athlete. The Panasonic's cameras work by detecting variations in skin color on the athlete's faces. The archers of the previous Olympics, they, they did wear devices that measured heart rates, but the devices were, were often a little imprecise due to, to varying skin tone. Interestingly, one would think that a visual means of measurement, such as these cameras, would be even more prone to mistakes. But 26 separate studies have shown the devices to, to be pretty accurate. And while the intended purpose of this data is primarily entertainment, medical professionals are using similar technology to detect visual changes in patients that the human eye may fail to see. And in this way, much like technology researched and developed by space agencies like NASA or militaries, technology we see in sports can find their way to the common individual. For example, research at the Mount Sinai Health System have been allowing doctors to use computer vision and machine learning to identify markers of neurological illnesses such as stroke or hemorrhaging with, with a lot more confidence. And as of 2019, their systems could identify problems on a CT scan in 1.2 seconds, that's 150 times faster than any physician. And software in sports has, has always particularly fascinated me from devices like velocity trackers for barbells, uh, simple workout trackers on my iPhone to the Apple Watch, which every year seems to grow more and more in biometrics monitoring capabilities. And of course there's emerging tech and machine learning as well. Using technology to improve athletic performance, I think it's one of the coolest things that we do as humans. And when you think about it, we're using our large, cumbersome, calorically expensive brains to improve upon our soft, fragile bodies. But the only things that humans are actually quite physically competent at compared to Earth's other animals are distance running and throwing. Fortunately, we're competing against each other and not racing cheetahs. So yeah, now that we've leveled the playing field by competing only against ourselves, how do we gain an advantage over others? Well, we train, we train a lot and we develop better training regimens. Sometimes someone comes along and invents something cool, some new equipment that allows us to play safer or break new records. And sometimes just seeing others break records allows us to, well, it unlocks something within us. And those old records are, are suddenly in humanity's rear view. And I'll be honest, I'm actually not a huge sports fan, a little secret there, but I am fascinated how year after year, we continue to break world records. You're almost wondering how this is ever gonna end. And I believe that tech actually plays a huge role in this and will, its role will continue to grow going forward. So how do we do it? How do we collectively push the athletic envelope year after year? Well, of course, medicine and pharmacology play a big role. Of course, there's the one controversial topic of PEDs, that, you know, the industry's favorite perennial topic that we won't get much into today. Uh, there are, of course, perfectly legal supplements. Uh, creatine and protein powder are probably the most researched. And we do understand far more about nutrition and building dietary regimens than we ever have before. And we also understand more than ever the effect of an athlete's psycholo uh, psychological state on their performance. This is often a cliche in golf. Uh, you see it in movies a lot, but it's very real. And uh, mentally grounded athletes have a very real competitive advantage over their more unstable peers. Visualization, realistic goal setting, and just the, the self-perpetuating motivation that comes from, from hitting those goals. Even meditation is a pretty well understood performance booster. And just as mentioned, there's a sociological component as well to improving overall athletic performance as a group. 
uh, simply seeing others achieve new heights kind of instills a belief in ourselves. And belief is powerful. And suddenly we see more and more athletes achieving records previously thought unattainable just on the basis that, well, someone else did it, I can too. Well, there are, of course, um, also the effects that living in a society that appreciates and rewards achievement in sport, living in such a society allows us the luxury to pursue athleticism. But modern training also necessitates data, lots of it. Goal setting is important, but we need a means of tracking goals and performance in sports as well as in any other discipline. We can see visually when other athletes are performing well or performing poorly, but without data, it's difficult to develop a concrete plan to address those differences. So with that fourth element, computer science, we complete what is considered to be uh, the four domains that make up the science of sport. Well, there isn't a lot of information that, or at least that I could find on when exactly we began using computers to track data with the ultimate goal, at least, of advancing the practice of sport itself. We had, for some time since really computers were able, been using computers to archive game scores. But the idea of approaching sports as a scientific discipline has its roots in 1960s Germany with the board, uh, birth rather, of sport informatics. In fact, sport informatics was originally only a blend of three of the four categories I just previously mentioned, uh, medicine, psychology, and sociology. Well, this was later built upon by Jurgen Pearl at Mainz University who added computer science to the mix. Since then, several organizations have formed around the world, specializing in the marriage of these disciplines to, to further the science of sport. In fact, well, we can start at the 1960s. It seems to be a great starting point for technology in sports. And that's when Seiko launched a new automated timing device that could take photo finished pictures to an accuracy of one one hundredth of a second. This is not that device. This one's actually one from the 90s. But well, judging even human runners by eye can be pretty difficult. I can only imagine the arguments that must have occurred over, say, horse races. And these days, goal line photography can now take thousands of photos a second to actually really truly eliminate doubt. Uh, runners blocks have automatic false start detection. Swimmers use touch pads to engage the winner. And without sensors, just imagine how difficult fencing matches would be to judge. Well, as far as other uses, umpires and referees rely on sophisticated playback technology to handle close calls. Uh, we use databases and complicated software packages to track statistics and keep score. And trainers use software to simplify progression schemes to make calculations and predictions for their athletes. When, of course, we use software in the development and research of a better gear tool, which is often you know, fun to buy. But there are two areas in particular that fascinate me the most. One is computer-assisted biomechanical analysis and the application of machine learning to biomechanics and training regimens. I think these two areas are the, the secret sauce to how we'll continue to set world records and continue to push the boundaries of human performance. Since 2012, BMW have offered the Olympic teams of the United States its motion tracking technology to assist in biomechanical analysis most notably the U.S. swim team in 2016. LED illuminated markers are placed on the swimmers' bodies, allowing coaches to more easily observe athletes' movements. The 3D printed markers are placed at all the hinge points of the body, and then BMW's computer vision algorithms can provide real-time data so coaches can, can find areas of improvement. And previously, also in 2012 in London, BMW provided a similar technology to long jumpers to measure velocity. With the data and the playback footage, calculations can then be made on the spot to adjust uh, approach speed, takeoff angles, and allow athletes to determine their next approach immediately, rather than having to go through multiple iterations of jumps and exhausting themselves physically to figure out the perfect angle. Well, in both cases, for the swimmers and the long jumpers, this means fewer injuries. 
Well, computer vision aims to enable computers to identify objects in the same way that our eyes interact with our brains to identify objects. Uh, with say the lenses being the eyes and the computers themselves being the brains. It's intrinsically tied to machine learning in this way, but how does it work? Well, actually there are already a couple of uh, computer vision tech talks on CoCrystal, so please go check those out. But for now, just a few basics on this. Computer vision can be broken down into a few different tasks, uh, four of which are seen here. Classification aims to pattern an image and match it with learned patterns over time to classify an object. Then you can add localization to that process to place where the object is in a frame. Detection uh, separates multiple instances of an object, even if they're similar in shape. And segment identification further aims to define the borders of an object uh, to really see exactly which pixels in that image belong to the object. And all of this is done by feeding computers countless images as data for algorithms. Over time, computers learn to recognize patterns, just like our brains. And these methods can be all combined to assist in tracking. It starts by recognizing single objects and installing bounding boxes around that object. With each new frame, the bounding box moves to the area of maximum score where the image is repeated and recognized with the highest confidence. Upon such, uh, every successful repetition, the model becomes more confident in its calculation. Best case scenario, this is all shot from a stationary camera with a controlled background, like say a soccer field. In a car where both the camera and the background are rapidly changing, accurate vision is incredibly difficult to implement. And that's one reason fully autonomous cars are always perpetually five years away. And why we often hear of hilarious or unfortunately, um, sometimes tragic accidents involving computer-assisted driving. Injury prevention is, I think, a very interesting application for computer vision tech. I grew up playing baseball. Uh, specifically, I was a pitcher. And I understand very well how many pitchers have to fight through pain to get through a lot of games. But also need to know when to back off to prevent injury. It's a pretty delicate dance. And many pitchers require Tommy John, uh, Tommy John surgery every year to replace their owner collateral, uh, collateral ligament that's through here. And biomechanical analysis with computer vision software helps teams look into corrective training for pitchers to prevent pain and prevent injuries before they occur. Especially effective is when this combines with sensors or cameras, say, to gather data for uh, statistics such as uh, valgus torque. That's what happens when you move your elbow in this direction and it affects the ligaments through here. But let's get into a newer field that takes injury prevention, I think, to a whole nother level. Machine learning. That's right. Seems like everyone these days is, is doing it, uh, rushing to apply machine learning to their respective field. Uh, from the recent GitHub Copilot for developers to Tesla's nearly autonomous cars to all the fields that have already been using machine learning for years. It's a fascinating topic and it's spawning an entire industry and interest has never been higher. While the topic of injury prevention is still fresh in our minds, let's take a step back and look at how machine learning is being used to prevent injuries. Pro football or soccer for us Americans. Their players experience between 2.5 and 9.4 injuries per 1,000 hours of exertion. A third of these numbers are, or rather injuries, are predictable. With the right data points, fewer injuries can happen when those data are run through the appropriate prediction models. Now, even in youth football, the numbers are as high as 19.4 injuries per 1,000 hours of exertion, ending many careers before they ever begin. <clears throat> this is Alessio Rossi. He was one such player. Now he's a postdoc researcher at the Department of the Computer Science, uh, Department of Computer Science at the University of Pisa in Italy, where he works closely with athletes on injury prevention. Using GPS or data they can they can glean from the previously mentioned cameras or many other forms of data, he can predict injuries within weeks or even days. <clears throat> Now here's the basic machine learning prediction 
model according to the cross industry, industry standard for data mining. Now, this probably looks at least somewhat familiar to what we already do as software developers. And this same process could be used in machine learning for injury prevention. In a very rough approximation, understanding the sport and the players, understanding the techniques and biomechanics involved, gathering data, modeling hypothetical corrections, um, evaluating results. And then you do it all again and keep adjusting as you go along. At the business understanding stage, athletes' physical loads are monitored and data can be gathered by GPS accelerometers or any other devices and various sleeves or wraps or what have you. And they also measure external training loads such as heart rate and blood pressure. They factor in age, height, weight, and other biometrics. In data understanding, game and seasonal performance is measured. Distance travel, games won, goals scored, uh, other history, player history, uh, player interactions with other players. And overall, we go through this whole process and the data is bundled and holistically evaluated to keep players in optimal shape, hopefully out of the surgeon's office and on the field. And Rossi and his team can predict injuries with up to 80% accuracy, especially in team sports with large data sets. Uh, in sports such as, say, figure skating, it's, it's a little more tenuous, a little more difficult because there are fewer data points. And one incredibly interesting case of machine learning was actually brought to my attention by one of my classmates. Thank you, Felipe. Researchers at the Simon Fraser University and University of British Columbia in Canada developed a machine learning algorithm using Unity and Python that taught itself biomechanically efficient ways to perform the high jump and long jump. And I think this is pretty cool. Well, athletes today almost universally perform a backwards maneuver called the Fosbury flop, popularized by Dick Fosbury when he won the Olympic gold during the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City. Well, that means decades, nay, centuries occurred before anyone caught on to this move. Prior, jumpers performed the slide, they perform the straddle, uh, scissors, western roll, many others, until Mr. Dick Fosbury caught on and changed the game. Now keep in mind, the model started from zero. It had never seen any sort of high jump before. The researchers gave it a clean slate and one task, jump as high as possible. And so the AI did. From the paper, our strategy learning task is formulated as a standard reinforcement learning problem where the character interacts with environment to learn a control policy which maximizes long-term reward. What does that mean? The AI takes incremental actions to increase reward, which is a calculation of height jumped. And this is important, the naturalness of movement as limited by what humans are actually capable of doing. Otherwise, the, the model, not constrained by flesh and bone and years of injuries, could perform much higher jumps than any human would ever possibly be able to imitate. And over time, the AI developed a variety of strategies that actual humans have found over hundreds of years. Now, there's a lot of text on this slide, but the key takeaway here is that the AI naturally progressed and discovered each type of jump on its own with nothing but neat machine learning math. And then they compared the jumps to that of real athletes with uh, motion capture footage. The AI was able to jump seven tenths of a meter higher. Now for, for, for uh, perspective, the current world record is 2.45 meters. So when you're jumping seven tenths of a meter higher, that's a, a sizable difference. Now, how this actually translates to the real world and outside of a simulation, I, I don't know. I haven't seen any studies on that where athletes have taken these models and, and used them to change their routines yet. But it's still quite impressive given that in the beginning of the simulation, the model could barely jump without stumbling. Also, here we have a mingling of our previous topic, biomechanics and computer, computer vision, which is, I think, pretty cool. But one especially practical study was on physical impairment. Researchers gave the model such challenges as an inflexible spine, 
or an injured leg to see how it would adapt. Now, while the research itself didn't dive too deeply into this topic, I can absolutely envision the benefits further research of this nature can bring for say the upcoming Paralympic games or other athletes with uh, special physical challenges. Now, my goal of this talk was to play with the code. Um, unfortunately, on the computer that I'm running at the moment, can't run uh, Unity with Python behind it. So if anyone is curious, you can visit their GitHub, play with the code, have a look around. Seems like a lot of fun. I will be playing with it going forward. And with that, thank you. I couldn't dive too deeply into code today, but I do hope you at least gain a little bit of curiosity into the, the world of sports technology. Thank you.